Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. It's Friday, May 4th. This is the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm Aaron Dykes. Tonight on the InfoWars Nightly News, Hoppy Heidelberg remembered. A true patriot speaks from the InfoWars vault. Plus, re-education camps planned for U.S. citizens and pat-downs and scanners citywide in Chicago for the upcoming G20 summit. All that and much more on the InfoWars Nightly News. And now, your host, Aaron Dykes. First up tonight in the news, yes, the re-education camps do apply to American citizens. I understand this is shocking, but as Paul Joseph Watson writes, the time for denial is over. Yesterday, of course, we were covered the leaked U.S. Army document that outlines in more than 300 pages, I might add, the plan for re-education camps in America. I can't believe it either, but yes, they do use the word re-education, and they repeatedly refer to operations inside U.S. territory domestically with, op uh, with organizations like the Department of Homeland Security, ICE, the Immigration and Customs, group and others that would only be operating on U.S. soil and not in the foreign countries where there are already camps ongoing. What we have here is the camps we've been sold under the guise of the war on terror now being legitimized for use with American citizens as they pass the National Defense Authorization Act authorizing the indefinite detention of even American citizens without any due process. And so to fight the denial over this issue, and understandably, it's hard to grasp. You can't believe your government's doing this, but they are, and they're not your government. Paul Watson has highlighted all the quotes about how the psychological operations officers are going to be brainwashing people in the camps, separating out political activists, determining uh, who may be malcontents or trained agitators, determining who needs to be indoctrinated through loudspeakers and propaganda films, and on and on, all part of this Department of Defense document for internment and resettlement specialists. And there's been other documents. We've covered them over the years. This is all a brewing storm. So it refers to in the document, DCs, that's displaced citizens or civilian internees. And it talks about things like implementing policies, quote, within U.S. territory as part of civilian support operations in the aftermath of man-made disorders, accidents, terrorist attacks, or incidents inside the U.S. territories. We know from past documents, one of the scenarios they're training for is a total economic collapse, and you'll see that playing out in this document as well. And again, within the United States or U.S. territories, Territories during civilian support operations, during emergencies, controlling displaced citizens, resettlement conducted as part of civil support operations will be conducted by lead agencies, including FEMA and Homeland Security. Uh, in another part of the document, it refers to listing prisoners' names along with their first, last name, as well as their social security number. Foreigners don't have social security numbers, only citizens of the United States. So it's clear at least part of this plan, while it does also apply overseas, is beginning to deal with how to treat Americans here at home. And we know the history as well. Paul Joseph Watson has outlined it in detail in his article from today, yesterday, as well as other articles. There was the ad in 2009 for the National Guard to recruit internment resettlement specialists, the exact language used in this document. In December of last year, only a few months ago, we got the documents where Halliburton's subsidiary, KBR, was subcontracting people to run the camps. Everything from sanitation to fencing to food and the rest of it. In 2006, there were all the newspaper articles, including the Houston Chronicle, pointing out how KBR had been contracted to build the camps. I believe the number was 386 million million or more, uh, or was it billion? I don't remember off the top of my head. And of course, we have the history over Rex 84, which ostensibly is a way to deal with the mass exodus of basically Mexican people crossing the border and others trying to cross the U.S. border. But in reality, hearings during the Iran-Contra scandal and more circa 1987 revealed that actually it was a secretive drill 
quote, developed by the federal government to suspend the Constitution, declare martial law, assign military commanders to take over state and local governments, and detain large numbers of citizens deemed to be a national security threat. And again, we see the buildup over and over here. This is a slippery slide into tyranny, and these detainment camps are, of course, the end of the road for anything we can consider to be freedom. It's based on North Korean models, Soviet gulag models, Nazi concentration camp models, and more, and they're really looking to bring it here. We've seen it time and again. They're really building up for something. They know the economy's collapsing, and here we have Quotes from Bill Ayers from the Weather Underground documentary uh, in another Paul Joseph Watson article. Obama mentor wanted Americans put into re-education camps. Weather Underground terrorists plan to eliminate 25 million U.S. citizens in re-education camps. This is based on the testimony and the statements you could find in that documentary from former FBI agent Larry Grathwall, uh, who infiltrated the group and found that Ayers and his group were planning to re-educate Americans, and those who wouldn't be re-educated would basically be killed. They didn't really know how to run a country or what the economics would be based on. They just knew they wanted to take over with communism, socialism, infiltrate, split up legitimate groups, and really just break things down in America. In fact, they don't work for truly socialist communist ideologies. They really work for the elite. I think you see that if you look closely at what the Weather Underground stood for. But of course, Ayers has been repeated linked to Obama. He helped raise Obama, basically put him through school, was close friends with him. Obama was known to meet in his living room repeatedly, and they basically launched his political career there in the Chicago area. We have clips from that film, including some of the quotes from Bill Ayers. Let's go to those now. I brought up the subject of what's going to happen after we take over the government. Uh, you know, we, we become responsible then for administrating, you know, 250 million people. The only thing that I could get was that they expected that the Cubans and the North Vietnamese and the Chinese and the Russians would all want to occupy different portions of the United States. They also believed that their immediate responsibility would be to protect against what they called the counter-revolution. And uh, they felt that this counter-revolution could best be guarded against by creating and establishing re-education centers in the Southwest. Uh, where we would take all the people who needed to be re-educated into the new way of thinking and teach them how things were going to be. I ask, well, what is going to happen to those people that we can't re-educate, that are die-hard cap capitalists? And the reply was that they'd have to be eliminated. And when I pursued this further, they estimated that they would have to eliminate 25 million people in these re-education centers. And when I say eliminate, I mean kill. And that's from the short doc, from the documentary No Place to Hide, a short clip from there. I've seen the other documentary, The Weather Underground, also interesting. Uh, I think from memory he was in it too. Anyway, we have some Bill Ayers quotes. Uh, was he sorry for helping to bomb official federal government buildings? I don't regret setting bombs. I feel we didn't do enough. He says, he also said, everything was absolutely ideal on the day I bombed the Pentagon. I was on board with President-elect Obama, he surely later said. Uh, and you got to ask, how did they ever even get access to the Pentagon building, to the White House, uh, to the State Department offices, and on and on? I really think that case stinks badly. But that's for another time. Meanwhile, when would we see these re-education camps? And by the way, you should search the document for the term re-education. It's in there. I think it's spelled all one word without the dash, re-education. Uh, anyway, one of those scenarios is based on economic collapse. We know that the Army War College advised a number of states, including Arizona, to prepare for economic riots under and civil unrest under a further economic collapse. So could this be part of the collapse? There are 100 million working age Americans that do not have jobs. This a new post from the economic collapse blog. Lots of good information there. 
The unemployment crisis in America is much worse than you're being told. Did you know there are 100 million working age Americans that do not get up in the morning and go to work? No wonder it seems so many don't have jobs. And so this is the case of the classic underreporting of unemployment. Officially, there's some 12.6 million unemployed Americans. But in reality, there's an additional 87.8 million uh, adult Americans who are otherwise eligible to go to work who don't, but they're not counted in unemployment numbers because they're, quote, not seeking work, and thus they fudge the numbers by putting those people in totally different categories. And yes, a few of those people are stay-at-home mothers and things like that, but a lot of them surely intend to be working but simply haven't found jobs. They don't count people who gave up looking for work. They only count people recently looking for work, such as in the last four weeks, and on and on. And it's just terrible unemployment numbers. You can see where they've deceived us yet again about how bad the economy really is. They know the collapse is coming. That's why they have so many pieces in preparation to deal with it. They just want to fool the public long enough to keep us from stopping the draconian, surely authoritarian measures they have in mind. Just another piece of that larger picture all these summits, all these meetings they have year, year after year, they build them up to be big billion dollar security events. It's not even just about the merging of all these Atlantic and Western nation countries, such as at the upcoming NATO summit or at the upcoming G8 summit. It's also about a big spectacle a big security showdown, entire cities on lockdown, all your rights are suspended, protesters are dealt with as though they're rioters or, or violent or something when occasionally they do have a few rioters, but they're usually feds infiltrating to give them a bad name. Anyway, Secret Service wants pats, pat downs and porno scanners in the Chicago during the summit, the NATO summit, TSA's mission creep has infected security arrangements for the upcoming NATO War Council to be held in Chicago beginning May 20th. Some stations on the Metro, Electric Line, and South Shore Line could be shut down during the upcoming NATO summit, and others could face airport-style security screenings. And we've already seen the other statements about how the whole city is on lockdown. They're advising uh, residents to evacuate, particularly from the downtown area. I know someone who tried to fly into the country through Chicago over a month and a half, almost two months ago, and they were being interrogated on their possible intentions to protest this NATO and G8 summit. The G8 summit was once going to be in Chicago. Now it's being held uh, at uh, Camp David, I think. But you've got CBS local in Chicago covering the fact that they could have these airport-style security crackdowns and how the metro lines didn't like it. They tried to fight against it and had only partial victories as the super security complex will be directing what they're allowed to do during the time of the summit. Just incredible the kind of lockdowns they have there. And why? Just so a bunch of unelected bureaucrats, heads of state can supposedly represent the whole world when they weren't elected to do so, uh, enter us into all these agreements, pursue these phony NATO wars for imperialistic control, and on and on. Who could like anything they're doing? And yet those protesters are being treated as the enemy. Uh, meanwhile, in the EU, there's been an exposed plot to scrap Britain. This, of course, has been ongoing, part of the larger European Union agenda. Senior Eurocrats are te secretly plotting to create a super powerful EU president to realize their dream of abolishing Britain, the London Express can now reveal. A covert group of EU foreign ministers has drawn up plans for merging the jobs currently done by Herman von Rompuy, president of the European Council, and Jose Manuel Barroso of the European Council. So to be a super EU president, also unelected over both of those bureaucrats, technocrats. Uh, they themselves are said to have had some fighting and squabbling, so they'll have to put a new super lord over them. And part of that is, of course, to subdue uh, Britain, who's been really revolting against a lot of the EU platform, for better or for worse. It's a super state with unelected bureaucracy, and they're trying to bring Britain into that. They haven't yet accepted the euro. Even as the euro is collapsing, they'll pressure them to do that as well. And therefore, a number of British people affiliated with the European Parliament have spoken out against it. One uh, Euro MP, Paul Newtall of the UK Independence Party, the same one that Nigel Farage is in. So this is a truly
utterly ridiculous idea that must never be allowed to happen. It sounds as if they're trying to go back to the days of the Holy Roman Emperor and others saying how my worry is the president will end up having the charisma of Von Rumpoy and the economic management skills of Barroso. And we'll surely flesh out more information on that this year at Bilderberg as those figures or those closely related to them meet annually at that summit. That one is coming up in Chantilly, Virginia at May 31st. Alex Accrue will be there. We hope you'll join him. Meanwhile, California has a medical pot crackdown in upscale Santa Barbara. Uh, what's going on here is they're cracking down on the medical marijuana supply chain, these different dispensaries that have certainly been controversial. But really, overall, this is a Tenth Amendment issue. Californians, love them or hate them, have voted to okay these dispensaries. Their laws uphold these things, and yet you've got the feds leading the crackdowns on them, and they coerce a number of the local and state authorities to go along with their crackdowns. The moves on Santa Barbara storefronts and cultivation facilities mark the fourth such sweep in recent months in the seven-county California region that ranks as the largest federal law enforcement district in the nation and on and on. And that's just to discourage overall states moving to allow for medical marijuana or for decriminalizing its use and on and on. And who, what, who, how many people has marijuana killed? I believe the official statistics are still zero. Meanwhile, how many people have been killed just in police raids busting people who supposedly have marijuana or other drugs? I'm sure the number is far greater. Just yesterday, I know Alex covered this article, UCSD students five day ordeal in a DEA jail sparks outrage. He was allegedly part of an ecstasy distribution ring and may have had to deal with other drugs and weapons, according to this article. Uh, he was forgotten by a DEA agent and left in a cell for five days, had to drink his own urine to survive. That's how lawless these prisons are and this larger war on drugs, just showing some of the hypocrisy there. Meanwhile, a bit of upbeat news or downbeat, depending on how you look at it, it's nothing short of incredible what the Ron Paul campaign and especially his grassroots supporters have achieved despite the total media blackout on Ron Paul, despite the regurgitated meme that he can't win, won't win, despite all the disowning from inside the Republican Party, still activists are winning delegates on the local, state, and eventually the national level in many, many, many caucus states. And now they are clearly concerned about what's going to happen in Nevada. A very odd state for the Ron Paul vote, since he didn't get even 1% more votes than he got in 2008, even though he grew in popularity all across the country, even though Nevada is known for its libertarian base, it was known for overwhelmingly supporting Ron Paul. He didn't get even one more of the popular votes there. Now they're trying to block, as they did previously, the delegate action in favor of Ron Paul there. And they are saying that the entire delegate base from Nevada may be blocked from attending the national convention. I believe it is highly likely that any committee with jurisdiction over the matter would find improper any challenge to the election, selection, allocation, or binding of delegates, thus jeopardizing the seating of Nevada's entire delegation of the national convention, said John R. Phillip Jr., the chief counsel for the RNC, in a letter obtained by the Las Vegas Sun, showing their intention to block the delegation in hopes that it would stop any kind of mass Ron Paul movement there. Meanwhile, the head of Ron Paul's campaign in Nevada, Carl Bunce rebutted all this, saying the strategy is well within the rules. It's ridiculous. It's nothing more than a veiled threat, according to Bunce, who went on to say, you can't come in seventh inning and say we're going to change the rules here. The Romney campaign advisor has come in and give you a loyalty test on who you support before you can go to bat. This is tyranny. If you can come in and change the rules whenever you want, that's not a republic. That's tyranny. Well, I got bad news for you, Bunt. The entire political party structure is part of the tyranny. We weren't supposed to have political parties in this country. They're not American. They work against our democratic traditions. They weaken our republic. We're not supposed to be loyal to these political parties. I think it's great what the Ron Paul delegates have achieved thus far in so many states. I hope they continue their efforts. They should not stop short of total chaos, of course, nonviolent, peaceful chaos. At the Republican convention, there's nothing to back with Mitt Romney. He's just an Obama light. He pushed for the same health care system. 
He also signed the anti, uh, <coughs> excuse me, he also signed the anti-assault weapons bans things in Massachusetts and so many other platform positions. The Ron Paul people should voice their displeasure with the same old candidates, the same old tired, false opponents inside this party system and back Ron Paul all the way. Our country's going down the tubes anyway. At that point, I will bring you to our quote of the day. It's from Dwight D. Eisenhower, when from his inaugural speech in 1953, Americans indeed, all freemen, Remember that in the final choice, a soldier's pack is not so heavy a burden as a prisoner's chains. Dwight D. Eisenhower. Now, we're going to go to break. We're going to come back with not one, but two Hoppy Heidelberg interviews, the key uh, juror for the grand jury in the Oklahoma City bombing investigation. He's been on before. We're going to play those for you now. Incredible, powerful information. Don't miss it. And don't forget to watch, but also share with your friends, family, and contact a noble lie exposing the larger picture of the Oklahoma City bombing. And don't forget to support us at PrisonPlanet.tv. Your subscribership helps fund our operation, and you're getting the word out. Help us, helps us turn things around in this country. Thank you and good night. We'll be back again next week. Have you been to InfoWarsShop.com lately? Express your inner patriot with these brand new InfoWars t-shirts. Say it loud with the InfoWars bullhorn shirt. Or educate the sheeple with the Bill of Rights shirt. Grope the public's mind with the TSA shirt. And with this shirt, you can let the dark side know of the Rebel Alliance's power. All available at InfoWarsShop.com. Sick of the globalist eugenicist control freaks adding poison to your water and laughing as you get sick and die? Start purifying your water with ProPure. My friends, I've done a lot of research, and the best gravity filter out there, bar none, is ProPure. And it's available discounted at InfoWars.com. Its filters are silver impregnated to prevent bacterial growth. There's no priming required. It's NSF 42 certified. Optional fluoride filters can reduce fluoride up to 95%. Easy to set up and use. Doesn't require electricity. Purify water from lakes, streams, ponds, and wells. This filter system leaves in beneficial minerals, which is key. Save money by not buying bottled water and avoid BPA that leaches from the plastic. ProPure is the best gravity-fed filter out there. It's what my family uses. Infowars.com already has the lowest price on ProPure. But if you add the promo code WATER at checkout, you get an additional 10% off at Infowars.com. You can also call to order 888-253-3139. Now, for the next hour, going to our guest, uh, Hoppy Heidelberg, um, who, of course, uh, was instrumental uh, in, at first, really exposing that a cover-up was uh, going on. And he is also uh, joined there uh, by one of the producers, Chris Emery, who we had on last week. And uh, it's, it's, it's great to have... Uh, Hoppy Heidelberg back with us. He's been on four or five times in the last 16 years that I've been on air, but and and, and he's been through so much, you know, to tell the truth. But but I want to get different people on survivors, grand jurors, uh, police officers, you know, mothers. Uh, we actually have a police officer uh, who's actually been threatened. We may be able to get on one of the ones they didn't kill. Uh, just just to illustrate for, you know, for the people that were there what really happened and how this was blamed on the anti-globalist movement and the states' rights movement. And then, of course, there's all the White House memos and things saying they sure need another one. It would sure be great. It was a new Oklahoma City. Very nasty how dumb they think we are to publicly talk about this. So he was the grand jury uh, foreman, uh, and he investigated evidence surrounding the Oklahoma City bombing. And then, of course, we have Mr. Emery with him as well joining us. Gentlemen, I could ask a lot of questions here, but I, I want to welcome you both back. And, and until we go to break in 10 minutes, instead of me just throwing out the first questions, uh, you guys start talking about whatever you think uh, is most important. Alex, the first thing I want to do is make a correction there. I was not the foreman of the grand jury. If I had been, it would have been a completely different outcome. Well, see, I'm going back from a decade plus, yeah. so some of my memory gets foggy. I apologize. <laughs> no problem. I just want to make that clear that uh, because they kept bringing that up. Well, you're not the foreman. You can't demand this and you can't demand that. Maybe that's that. where I got it in my brain. But it, Yeah. 
How long has it been since we talked? Something like five, six, seven years? Oh, at least, yeah. A long okay, time so Hoppy, Hoppy was on the, the uh, grand jury. Please continue. Well, uh, they handed us, uh, when they called us back in December of 94 to come in, and then they excused the people who couldn't serve, and then they drew out of the hat the names of the people that were going to serve, and then they gave us a handbook called the Grand Jurors Handbook. And I took mine home, and I went through it first, highlighting it, and then I came back and underlined with red the most salient highlighted parts. And I understood that thing. I could have taken a quiz on it and made a 100. I, I understood that book. And I didn't realize that they didn't hadn't read the book and didn't understand it and were not going to go by it at all. So the first day that, uh, of course, I'd been on the grand jury since January 95, but the other grand jury, there's two sitting grand juries all the time at Oklahoma City. There's one that serves from January to January and one from July to July. Well, the July jury wasn't going to have time to do this, so we caught it and we started, I don't remember what it was, May or June, but anyway, the very first day that we started hearing evidence, uh, I call it that, on uh, the bombing, they told us that we couldn't question witnesses. Well, that's crazy. I mean, that's the whole purpose of a grand jury hearing like that, is for grand jurors to be able to question witnesses. So I showed them in the book where that I could uh, question witnesses and that I planned to. And uh, finally, they, we came to a compromise. We just had to call it off for a while, and, we, and they came to a compromise, said, okay, you can question, and I was the only one that was allowed to question. You can question, but you have to submit your questions in advance. Well, of course, the book, that was bull. The book didn't say that. But I was smart enough to know that that's not really a big deal. I'll submit one question, and then based on the answer to that question, I'll come with the rest of the questions I have. So I got around the one-question rule, and I got around the giving them in advance the question rule. The biggest problem was there wasn't any que These people that they brought in to testify knew nothing. There was no questions really to ask of them. Uh, they would testify that they saw Tim McVeigh at a gun show five years ago. Well, big deal. That, had, that was not relevant at all to Oklahoma City. In fact, none of the testimony that I heard in that grand jury room was relevant to Oklahoma City. It was all about stuff that happened months and years before. And uh, it was just a dog and pony show. And I finally complained to him. I said, look, you're not bringing any witnesses in here to know anything. Here's, the, here's the witnesses that I want. They said, okay, when we get through, you give us your list of witnesses and we'll call them. And I believed them, which was not very smart. I should have known better. So when they were through with their witnesses, they brought in the bill for us to sign. And I never got to call any of my witnesses. So that's when I wrote the judge a letter and told him what had happened. I said, they promised me I could call witnesses. They didn't allow it. Uh, here's the list of witnesses that needed to be called. And I want you to make this happen. Well, I, again, I wasn't completely aware just how high this thing went. But there's, there wasn't any way I was going to get a federal judge to back me on this. Uh, I realize now. And so it took them a, about two or three weeks to decide what to do about my letter. And then they decided they just couldn't grant me my wish to call in actual witnesses because I could have proven right away that, that a truck bomb is not possible for a truck bomb to blow up that building. Yeah, they couldn't let you bring in Jane Graham, who saw government agents planting bombs and thought they were telephone repairmen. You, you, I mean, you couldn't call the former head of Air Force Weapons mm -hmm. Development. Uh, you couldn't call Terrence Yegi, the police officer that saw it all. I mean, you couldn't call for actual witnesses. They wanted you to just talk to random people that fit into their anti-patriot, anti-right wing propaganda system. Well, that's right, and that's why the judge, they finally decided that the judge just needed to fire me, so he just wrote me a letter and said, uh, your services are no longer needed, and if you don't keep your mouth shut, you're going to prison. And uh, each outburst will be a separate event, and you will have to serve your prison terms 
in order, one after the other, not at the same time. So uh, it was kind of a joke. And I, as soon as I got the letter out of the mailbox uh, from the judge, I faxed it to Channel 4, uh, K4, the TV station here, and that just blew the lid off of everything. I mean, that's tyranny with a capital T when they say, we'll throw you in irons if you ask any questions. That's exactly right. And, of course, later on it got even worse. They got even, uh, you know, more threatening. But uh, the judge, all he could threaten to do was just to put me in jail. Now, tell us about the other <laughs> threats, the FBI visit, all of it. Well, the, the FBI came down a, a, a couple of times, may have been three, I don't know. But I remember two occasions they came down. And uh, the one occasion that was the funniest is... Uh, uh, I was sitting, my desk is in a bay window right there in front of the house. So as they pull up and stop, and you know who it is because the car they're driving is obvious motor pool. And so when these guys get out, the guy on my side, the passenger side that got out, took his pistol out of his holster, his uh, shoulder holster, and stuck it in the waistband of his pants and then buttoned his suit jacket over the pistol. So I watched all that with interest. And so they came in, and of course, he was the bad guy. They do this just like a TV show. You got a good guy and a bad guy. And a good guy, he's real nice to you, and, and uh, wants to, he's come to help you, see? And a bad guy, he's come to threaten you, and, and if the good guy doesn't have any luck. So <clears throat> when the good guy wasn't having any luck, why the bad guy just stood up, unbuttoned his jacket, and exposed that pistol in his belt. And I was supposed to be afraid, I guess, is what it was. They were, it was some sort of emphasis. I mean, I was supposed to get some sort of message. And, I, and, and you can guess, I guess, what the message was supposed to be. But I thought it was the silliest thing I'd ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> and I just laughed at them. And uh, they finally just had to leave because they weren't getting anything done. And, uh, and I guess they liked uh, playing along with the people that killed all those kids. Because I know it's funny for you, but we've got to remember, Terrence Yankee got tortured to death. Uh, in fact, we might need to investigate exactly who those guys were that came to your house, because somebody's going to brandish a firearm on a, you know, a nice gentlemanly person like yourself. Who knows what else they'll do? Yeah, well, of course, I was supposed to think they were authorized to kill me, but I knew better than that. That's not the FBI's, that's not their job. That's a different... Well, case. they do that quietly, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they do that once they've got you off yeah. in custody, yeah. yeah. So the next time they came out, they sent a lady out. And that made it interesting. I thought, well, what the heck did they gonna accomplish with this sweet looking little old girl? And she turned out to be the pepper. She was mean, she was mean as a snake or something. <laughs> and uh, she said, do you know how much trouble you're in? And I'm gonna ask Hoppy later. I mean, I'm sure he's seen the different democratic strategists and uh, people. And of course the guy that helped cover up Oklahoma City is now the attorney general. Uh, Eric Holder, who was caught running a false flag into Mexico, uh, if he's creeped out by all these different statements, if he hasn't seen them, we can pull them up. But they're like, yeah, the president needs an Oklahoma City to look strong and get the people behind him. And, you know, we know it helped Bill Clinton. That's why I'm really revisiting this now. This film came out at a perfect time. It's a godsend, and it needs to be seen. Uh, but, uh, Hoppy, so you were telling us about the little whippersnapper, but see, you're a nice guy. You've got a tyrant at your house trying to intimidate you. The judge tried to intimidate you. They're way outside the law. They would love to live in North Korea. I mean, this is the plague to liberty. And you're just being, you know, oh, well, she was quite a whippersnapper because you're a real American. But please continue. Yeah, she said, do you know how much trouble you're in? I said, no, but I bet that's what you're here for, to tell me. And, and the other guys went to laughing, and that just kind of ruined the whole thing because I kept making them laugh and they finally just had to leave. I said, to tell y'all what, y'all go home and tell them you just scared the hell out of them and if they ever call, I'll back you up. <laughs> and they just, they just had to laugh and leave. But anyway, the little gal didn't get a whole lot done. You are something else. Uh, Chris Emery, I tell you, Hoppy Heidelberg's a treasure, isn't he? He certainly is. Uh, when I first met him, uh, Hoppy, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we spent almost five hours sitting at your kitchen table just talking about the case, what you went through. And I was just uh, trying to get some memory back uh, this morning on the way to the studio about that first meeting. 
After I left his house, Alex, I pulled over to the side of the road and it took me probably a, a full 30 minutes just to soak in what I had learned from him. Uh, this guy's a, a treasure. It's unbelievable wealth of information about the case. We're about to go to break. We have all the breaks at the end of the hour and the start of the hour. But Hoppy, uh, uh, you know, tell us what you've learned. Impart that knowledge on record of what really happened from your research in Oklahoma City. Well, you have to go back to 93 when the uh, anti-terrorist bill was before Congress and they couldn't get it passed. So they had the uh, 93 World Trade Center attempt to knock the towers down. And of course, that was a failure because the FBI ran that operation, according to the uh, New York Times. And uh, it, it failed and they didn't get the uh, legislation passed. So they waited a couple of years. Uh, they did some homework. They canvassed uh, a bunch of federal buildings to try to decide which one would do them the best job, work the best for them. And they settled on Oklahoma City because we were the only federal building with a daycare center in it. And they thought, well, now, <clears throat> the pictures of those little babies' bodies in the paper every morning and on the 6 o'clock news at night would probably get this bill passed for us. And it turned out they were correct. So that's why we won over Denver. It, the finalists were, were Oklahoma City, Denver, and Phoenix. But Oklahoma City won because they had the daycare center. Oh, absolutely. Veritas on a silver platter. Please continue. Okay. Uh, later on, um, they sent some people down with... Uh, with more serious threats, uh, people that were much more mysterious in nature, that uh, didn't claim to have any co official capacity. Hoppy Heidelberg and Chris Emery are our guests. So, uh, you, you, you were getting to all the different you know, FBI coming, brandishing guns, and you said more threats came. Yes. I was told that if I uh, filed a lawsuit that uh, everything would be forgiven. I, I could live. Everything would be fine if I didn't file a lawsuit. And as you'll recall, uh, Glenn Wilburn did file a lawsuit and did not survive. So it was not an empty threat. And uh, it didn't bother me a whole lot because he was, I'm going to sue Caesar in Caesar's court. I mean, come on. I, I wasn't going to sue anybody. And... Uh, so that was the end of that thread. It didn't really amount to But they were still to... scared of you calling witnesses and it being on record. Yeah, well, yeah, they were scared of anything, you know. And uh, then, you know, got the helicopter treatment later, but that's a, that's, that's a little different story. Well, I know, but, you know, as a, you know, as a, you know uh, Western Southerner, you know, folks don't like to talk about things that have happened to them, but you've got to tell us the rest of the story. Um, of uh, what happened to you, the, the other forms of harassment, because I've gotten the helicopter treatment, so has my family. Yeah. Well, they started flying three helicopters over my house uh, once a week, and they would circle my house very low until I came out and acknowledged their presence so they could go on. And uh, the message, I assume, was that we, we want you to know we know where you live. And any night we chose to, we could drop a bladder of gasoline on the roof in your house and shoot it with a flare and burn you and your family to death. That was the message. I understood the message. Um, I wasn't terribly worried about the message because people that do a lot of threatening aren't as likely to act as people who don't bother to threaten first. They just act. Yeah, because so I've said anybody doesn't think to my family, there's not going to be any threats made. I will yeah. guarantee that. And, and you know, what do they think is going to happen as they keep killing people and intimidating? Don't they know people are, are going to start responding back? I mean, we know where they're at as well. Well, yeah, but they have, they think they've got all the power because they've got the military might and they don't fear us because we, uh, as of yet, have not offered to resist uh, the way you have to. Well, that's because discretion is the greater part of valor, but the same yeah. thing happened for decades before 1776, Hoppy. Yeah, well, we're basically, we're in the same shape we were then. 
you know, uh, the, what the Crown was doing, sending out agents to uh, uh, eat out our substance uh, and all of that. That's exactly what's going on right now. I mean, the EPA, every government agency you can think of, their job is to eat out our substance to break us. They're determined to destroy the middle class, and they're well on the way. When they double and triple the price of food and fuel, they've got you because you can't do without either one. They wouldn't call anybody connected to it. They wouldn't call all the witnesses that were on the news saying they saw feds at McVeigh planting gray sticks of butter. They wouldn't call Terrence Yankee and the other police that showed up minutes into it. Uh, they wouldn't call, the, I mean, the governor said they were there and saw bombs removed. I mean, we have all these newscasts. They're in the film, A Noble Lie. And he was trying to ask these questions, and he went to the judge, and the judge just said, you're off of this, you're gone, even though grand jurors are supposed to be running things, not the other way around. And then they, the FBI keep coming to his house and, you know, opening their shirts up and showing him a firearm stuck in the, you know, the waistband, threatening him, and... Then helicopters flying around in his house you know, multiple times a week, uh, threats. And then he was told, don't file your lawsuit against us or you're going to end up dead. All will be forgiven. And then another gentleman did and ended up dead. Now, remember, cop of the year got killed. Other people got killed. I've talked, and we're going to try to get them on the show, police officers who've been threatened. Uh, Colonel Craig Roberts has talked about this, who was also a Tulsa police officer. Tulsa detective who they sent out there, um, separately an Army um, um, lieutenant colonel and before that famous Marine Corps sniper who wrote a bunch of best-selling books on sniping. The point is, all of this went on. They even tried to set up Colonel Roberts a couple times uh, for all sorts of things and were investigating him for terrorism because he dared talk about this. Now, years after he's off the Tulsa police force, they come to him and apologize. Uh, but that's all a side issue. Craig Roberts, a lot of great characters up there in... Uh, Oklahoma, Marine Corps sniper, colonel in the Army, uh, Tulsa Police Department SWAT team leader, helicopter pilot. In fact, one time the helicopter broke down over Tulsa, and he'll tell you the whole story of being an inch and a half shorter after the crash from his spine compressing. But side issue, going back to Hoppy Heidelberg, all this is going on. Bring us up to how, how were you given the message, you were saying shadowy figures, not FBI threatening you with guns now, that you're going to be dead if you file a lawsuit on us. Uh, tell us what the lawsuit was going to concern. I know we've talked about it over the years, but my memory's even foggy on this, Hoppy. And then, uh, you know, more about the helicopters, what they look like, and then uh, Mr. Wilburn and what happened to him. <clears throat> well, the... Um Lost my train of thought. Ask me a question. Well, that was a lot of questions. Me out. Well, 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 I mean, start uh, me with one. Let's get into the shadowy figures. Okay, this guy wasn't, he didn't have on a coat and tie. He had on Levi's and boots. But he was obviously not a cowboy. Turned out he was an attorney. I did a little homework later and found out who he was. He was an Oklahoma City attorney. And uh, he was trying to pretend to be my friend and my associate and be a cowboy and all of that. But uh, his approach, much lighter, much softer, no threats exactly, but his approach was way more serious than the guys that were trying to be bad. So I knew pretty much where the message was coming from. It didn't concern me because I didn't know, and I still don't know, that I had a lawsuit. Lawsuit for what? Sue the judge for kicking me off the jury? I don't know that that's not his... He didn't have the authority to do that. I don't know. What was the point of suing them? I, I wasn't going to sue, so I ignored it. It didn't bother me. I wasn't worried about it. And the helicopter thing didn't start till sometimes later. Before we finish, I want to do two points that come from General Parton. I don't have to do them right now, but there's two very important I'm going to write that down, uh, two points yeah. on Parton, and we two can also... Two points on Parton, yeah. yeah important. I'm, I'm going to write that down, but continuing with the threats, because that's evidence of the criminality, uh, but, but, but specifically, mm. was it like, I'm your friend, but you're not going to live if you go with this lawsuit. Everything will be forgiven, because you said that earlier. Well, he didn't... Now, he was smooth. This guy was not... Uh, he knew how to work it. He was good. That's why he, that's why he was sent. He was good. He was matter-of-fact. 
He was not threatening. He has a very nice, friendly tone of voice. Um, but that's what it, made it so creepy. Exactly. I, I knew exactly that this man was for real. He wasn't sent there to blow smoke or anything like that. He was just going to tell me exactly how it was going to be. And if I didn't like it, okay. It, it, it didn't really bother me. Uh, he was a nice guy. His threat was empty, not because they wouldn't do it. It was empty because I w had no interest in filing a lawsuit because I didn't have any, I didn't have anything in mind. I mean, what, what was well, my Well, there damages? was some type of suit they were concerned about, and we could talk about that later. Now, particularly with the helicopters, what did they look like, unmarked? Well, yeah, they were unmarked. Uh, I've, I've heard all the stories about the black helicopters and everything, and I will admit that a, a, a up high against a blue sky, they were so dark, they looked black. But they got down so low right in my yard, right around my house, that I, that they were a very dark green is what they were. They weren't really black. They, the mine, I, they, there are black helicopters, but mine were uh, a very dark green uh, helicopter. Yeah, so and, that's FEMA or, or an auxiliary of it. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't know, but I could look directly, not directly, I mean, but they didn't get down so low they was going to crash, but I, I looked right at the pilots, you know. We had eye contact every time, and... Um, I don't know. They may have come when I wasn't there a time or two, and I didn't come out. I don't know that. But I know that the, all the times that I came out, they circled till I came out. And then once I waved them off, they went on. Always three of them, always came from the same direction, always left in the same direction. So uh, Now, specifically, a, though, uh, tell us about the gentleman and who he was who did file a lawsuit. Oh, Glenn Welburn was an accountant here in Oklahoma City, and he lost two grandchildren in the daycare center. And uh, he's pretty sharp. He was pretty sharp. He figured out right quick that this was all bogus, that, you know, nothing that government said could hold water. It, just, it was something wrong with it. So he went to investigating, and he eventually got his daughter, who had standing, because it was her children that were killed, got his daughter to file a lawsuit against Tim McVeigh. <laughs> this is kind of odd, but what it did, it gave him the opportunity to uh, pursue documents uh, that they didn't want to give up, nor did they want to say we didn't want to give up. So it had the potential of being a problem. And... Uh, Therefore, they knew that the girl would not pursue the lawsuit if they got rid of her dad. And so when they got rid of uh, Glenn, why the lawsuit went away. And then he went away too. And then he went, well, yeah, he went away first and then the lawsuit went away. How did he go away? I, I forget. Uh, cancer, pan pancreatic cancer. Yeah. That was one of the worst ways to pass away. Glenn passed on, uh, I believe, a day or two after the McVeigh trial. The federal trial verdict was read. And uh, Charles has an incredible story of how Glenn just literally couldn't stand up straight and was crying in Charles's arms. Uh, this is, uh, I believe, a few days before he passed on. And he wanted Charles to continue on because Glenn knew deep down inside that whoever murdered his grandkids were getting away literally with cold-blooded murder, and he didn't want that to happen. And they do, it's declassified, have those fast-acting cancers. That's that's now been declassified. And there's been a lot of other deaths. Uh, what about Terrence Yankee? Well, Terrence Yankee, uh, as we uh, said last uh, Friday, uh, that he had passed on um, a year and three weeks after the bombing. It was on May 8, 1996. It was on a Tuesday. And um, he actually had turned, he was 30 years and six months old, uh, just a few days shy of that. Um, it, as, as you know, his death was was horrible. Uh, he had gone out to retrieve some records at a, a storage locker. Coincidentally enough, he'd shared with uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Charles Chumley, who passed away in a very suspicious plane accident in the fall of 1995. That's a whole other story for another time. We don't want to take up your uh, your radio show. No, no, that. we can tell that, or we can tell it tonight. Yeah, he was helping investigate too. 
Yes. In fact, uh, Dr. Chumley was Terry's back doctor. I mean, uh, it, like you said many times, uh, Alex, you couldn't make this up. The the people that cross paths, we're talking about one or two degree of separation with all of the key players in this investigation, not six or seven degrees. They were just once or two removed from knowing each other. I talked to Dr. Chumley's son about uh, three years ago. He would not talk to me in person, talked a few times on the phone, asked me not to call him back. He said he appreciated what we were doing on the film, but he really he didn't feel comfortable with pursuing Pursuing any other information. That's how scared they had his son. Was, well, I mean, I mean, here's the deal. At a certain point, if somebody killed my dad, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not making threats here. People are going to die. And I, I think America used to be like that. And so the system wouldn't act like this this much. But uh, I mean, what is it like for you guys living so close to it? Or what's it like watching Eric Holder on TV? I mean, let's talk about Eric Holder's role in all this. Well, of course, I wasn't aware. I mean, I knew that it was a federal operation, obviously, uh, but I wasn't aware of uh, Eric Holder's interest in this, and uh, I have not uh, done any homework on that and really uh, have no personal knowledge of Eric Holder's interest in the Oklahoma City bombing. What we have, Alex, we got to cover the Jamie Gorelick, of course, her signature is on the 9-11 Commission report, and she's on the, the group photo in, on the inside uh, jacket cover of that book. She was actually um, serving under the Justice Department, number two under Janet Reno. Eric Holder served in a lateral position at Jamie Gorelick. So you see these people rear their ugly heads, so to speak, on a judicial level. They're coming back in time and time again because they know they got literally got away with murder. It was Jamie Gorelick that we found out was actually barking the marching orders out to the Oklahoma uh, DA's office within days after the bombing on speakerphone yelling at the top of her lungs telling how the DA was going to investigate this case who they were going after who they were going to ignore and that was it there was no no uh, basically now why uh, do we even have courts but well, I mean I mean the, the the lawsuits that Jesse Trinity and others have filed they've, they've gotten the emails from Holder where he's in control of the cover-up and he's saying things like this is our number one priority in the Justice Department this is D-Day cover this up that just was, like Fast and Furious just that was a uh, Kenny Trinidad's murder and we have the internal documents you've seen them uh, Jesse has, has sent them uh, PDF internal emails from Holder's uh, top lieutenants and his, his underlings, his legal assistants, everybody was on the same page as far as how that investigation was going. And Jesse uh, basically sent, I believe, an eight-page letter to Patrick Leahy, who was in charge of the Senate subcommittee that was in charge of the hearings to uh, basically approve Holder's appro uh, appointment. And Leahy refused to, re to respond to uh, Jesse Trenadu and the fact that he, he had that letter, all of the facts were laid out. It's like Jesse was completely ignored. Uh, what about what about Larry Potts, uh, the, the, the head of the, the deputy FBI director? He, he said that he was in Dallas and then he he claimed that he flew Southwest Airlines there. Uh, World on Daily and others uh, broke this, uh, but it was also in some local papers, I know. And then it turned out because of storms that day, those flights didn't exist. And then the receipts came up that he was there the day before. And of course, that's what witnesses had said they'd seen. I mean, that's that's a pretty big deal right there. Uh, you guys got any comments on that? I'm reading a memo, actually, that was uh, put out by a colleague of ours that helped us with the film early on. Uh, Danny Coulson was the uh, the FBI agent. Uh, very peculiar situation there. I got to talk to... Okay, uh, then how was Larry Potts tied Because I'm going from memory here. Uh, this, this is amazing. Um, I, I actually uh, was in the archives in Austin uh, working with Wendy Painting on, on looking at a lot of the defense team papers. Larry Potts was actually best friends with Eric Holder. And there's an article in the Dallas Morning News we stumbled across going through all of these boxes of papers. Larry, uh, actually, uh, Eric Holder recused himself from prosecuting the Ruby Ridge case because Larry Potts was one of the, the t chief lieutenants in there. Since they were best friends, Holder, uh, one of his few uh, instances of having some ethics, had to recuse himself from that. These guys knew each other from way back. It was Larry Potts that ended up calling the shots, according to Terry Nichols, for um, Tim McVeigh. And McVeigh was upset because Potts took him off script. He changed the plans completely within a few hours before the bombing happened. Exactly. I've forgotten more about this than most people will ever learn, but I've, I've seen the copies of the hotel receipts. The government's had to admit that that was the case. So it was Colson who we have the receipts from that, what, Marriott, and then it's Larry Potts and the affidavits and, and the other witnesses yes, uh, who's there running the operation. Correct. These people, man, <laughs> blowing up daycare centers. I mean, they're just absolute demons. 
What is it like for you, Hoppy, just continuing to know this and watching these people walking around? Well, it's been so long and I'm getting so old that uh, there's not much shock value anymore. Uh, I understand everything that I need to understand. I know who's who and who does what for whom. Therefore, there's not much new under the sun that I could learn that would uh, worry me. Uh, of course, anybody would be worried about what's going on, but I know exactly what's going on in the world today and who's in charge of uh, trying to get it to happen. Uh, but because I'm a Christian, I know that uh, they're going to have a problem uh, they can't get everything done. They won't done unless God lets them. And I'm not sure he's going to allow all the bad things they've got planned to happen. So, <coughs> excuse me, that's really uh, my, uh, that's kind of where I'm, I'm backed up to the wall. And uh, I'm done about all I can done uh, do. And I've got to leave it up to these younger men and just leave it up to God to take care of it. And I'm just kind of retiring well that's what i've heard i heard a lot of people that are in a noble lie that this is this is time to ride off in the sunset well it's uh, it's my time uh just being diagnosed with something nobody wants to have and uh, i plan to beat it but nevertheless i will be occupied with that for the next few months and and won't have any time to uh i'm glad we're getting this done because uh, I don't know how many more opportunities we might have. Well, it'll be commercial free tonight on the news, and Aaron Dykes is doing it, so you'll have the complete floor for 30 minutes an hour as long as you guys want. I don't want to exhaust you. I didn't know this, Hoppy, that you have uh, have something that, that uh, nobody wants to get, but we'll all certainly pray for you. What, have you been diagnosed with cancer? Uh, I don't. I believe that words are very powerful, and therefore I hesitate to put certain things in words. No, I hear you. I hear you. Well, we'll all pray for you, my friend. Now, now you wanted to get into the bombs itself, which is really at the heart of the issue. And General Parton, who came immediately when he saw it on the news, columns at the back blown out with blast points, the, the, the columns right up by the truck not damaged. I mean, that's... And then the, the newscast saying bombs are being removed. Uh, wow. Uh, so, so break that down. Well, this is the one thing that I needed to blow this thing wide open. If I could have got a hold of, if I could have gotten General Parton, I knew I wanted structural engineers. I wanted to know how strong these columns were designed. How much pounds per square inch of pressure could they survive? I didn't know that. I couldn't know that without calling the, the engineers and the builders and everything of the building itself. Uh, I learned later that the columns were designed to withstand 3,500 pounds per square inch of pressure. I learned later from General Parton that you can calculate how fast blast pressure decreases by dividing it by the distance cubed. So it's real sharp. Let's say for argument's sake that the uh, closest column to the truck was 10 feet away. Now, it's easy to say, and the government said that the uh, ammonium nitrate bomb that was set off, which we don't necessarily believe, but anyway, they claim it generated 500,000 pounds per square inch of pressure. Well, 500,000 pounds is certainly enough to blow away a 3,500-pound design column. The problem is the distance. When you cube the distance and divide that into the pounds per square inch, here's what we get. We got 500,000 over the distance 10 feet cubed. 10 to 10 to 10. 10 to 10 is 100. 10 to 100 is 1,000. You got 500,000 over 1,000. You divide 1,000 into 500,000. You got 500. Now we got a whole different ball game. Now we got a 3,500 pound column and we only got 500 pounds of pressure. So that proves beyond the shadow of a doubt that it was physically impossible for any truck bomb, assuming it had ammonium nitrate in it, any bomb that the government said it was impossible for it to blow down even one 
column, much less go all the way east down the front of the building and then turn and go into the building and take out all those columns down on the east end. So what happened was physically impossible. What McVeigh was convicted of is physically impossible. Uh, all of that I could have proven if I had had the right uh, witnesses. And As course, a grand that's... juror, and, and expanding on that, I'm going from memory on this because uh, I don't go off notes. I go off memory, and I didn't want to use to be. But uh, did, wasn't it Controlled Demolition Incorporated that, that, that blew up the majority of the building that was left? They wouldn't let anybody get in and look at it. And uh, then on top of that, mm -hmm. they then buried it at a Wacken Hut landfill and poured concrete in with the chunks. But I, uh, all, and then, of course, it was Controlled Demolition Incorporated that helped uh, do the work at, uh, at the 9-11 site. Um, is that correct from my memory, uh, Hoppy? Uh, you may. Uh, uh, we have Chris may know that. I don't know. Yeah, we, have, we have photos of uh, CDI employees with their T-shirts at the, the bomb site uh, within about three days before it was demolished. Oddly enough, it was the same day that James Nichols was released from federal custody in Detroit, and uh, he was held up there on purpose for 30 days, so he wouldn't get out and support efforts such as Hoppy. And uh, the day he, in fact, he called me before Terry's uh, state trial and said, the morning I got out of, of federal custody in downtown Detroit at the federal courthouse was the morning uh, that they blew up the Murr building. And he was really upset because he wanted to be down there to find out the truth. When you give in to tyrants, when you buy into their propaganda, when you ignore your lion eyes and your gut, you manifest tyranny. You allow the worst in society to take over. And it was Oklahoma City that finally got me to go down and start my local access TV show that led to a local radio show and then a syndicated radio show and filmmaking. And I have reached hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of people, conservatively. And I'm just an average person who has a conscience and knows that really wicked murderers and criminals have to be exposed. A lot of people think you can just choose to say, oh, that's not true, and then that gives your conscience rest. And some people don't even have a conscience nowadays. And you notice society is degenerating. You know, I have a wife, I have three children, and I know full well the globalists are capable of anything. People ask me, then, why do you do what you do? Because there's no future if we don't stand up for these people. And I'm not worried about my future or even my wife or my children's future as much as I'm worried about humanity. And it's not because, oh, I'm some great, perfect, moral person. It's because I understand these basic truths. When you get a government that starts setting off rice tag fires, false flags, you're in trouble. And now we're a nation that pushes torture, secret arrest, preemptive war, Federal goons grope our children, stick their hands down babies' diapers, strip naked old ladies, and they tell us that's okay? I played clips on the news last night of four senators going, we want to scare people. We want U.S. citizens to be scared when we're going to torture them. And we want them, to, I mean, I didn't even know this was in the debate on the NDAA until a caller called. I, we played it last night. And you're a citizen and you ask for a lawyer? Lindsey Graham says, oh, no lawyer for you! And when you realize the federal government at that level, these guys are on the national security you know, uh, panels and things, they all know about 9-11. They all know about Oklahoma City. I mean, they're up there. They hate America. They hate freedom. These people are Mao Zedong's, Hitler's. They just are a bunch of old, wicked men. And they think it's real funny to go out and blow up a building. They, the, in fact, we're going to show this now on the nightly news. I've shown it before. Even Glenn Beck earlier this year said, the government's getting ready for a new Oklahoma City to blame it on domestic groups. Because they put out all these memos at the White House and top advisors saying, man, it sure helped us. A new one would sure be great, Mr. President. I mean, there's not one millimeter of, of paper-thin, uh, veiled statement there. That's how dumb they think we are. That's how controlled the FBI and CIA and NSA and police are. I've cornered the police chief here in Austin and others, and I've said, you know about this stuff, and they just go, oh, I just can't believe it, and they have fear in their eyes. I talked to the Travis County SWAT team years ago, and I said, you know this stuff's going on. They're like, yeah, we do. And then, of course, they must have been under surveillance because they you know, set them up and fired the leadership. But you know what? Again, at a certain point, you've got to say no to this evil. You've got to say no to it. 
And you've got to get past your fear and own it and say, I've made my decision. That's the end of it. You do what you're going to do. I leave it to God. Exactly what Hoppy said. It doesn't mean you don't do anything anymore. It means you say, I'm giving it to God, and God, you tell me what to do and take action on this. And I don't want to start preaching. I'm going to keep him right to the end of the show. We'll give him a 30-minute break, and we're going to tape a long interview uh, and uh, you know, recap everything tonight on the Nightly News and uh, get to some of those clips and documents. But this is a decision you've got to make. And if you think this is all there is in the world and it's all about TV dinners and beer and football games— and you know what? So what about those kids getting blown up? And forget what the witnesses inside said and the survivors. You want to just own the lie, take the great delusion and say, oh, we're a bunch of kooks? You make your decision then. You make your decision. You be with the timid cowards and the people that go along with it. I mean, I understand the military mind that did this. It's a gambit. That's a 3,000-year-old chess move from um, eastern, uh, what is, Persia today. You sacrifice a pawn in an early move to manipulate your enemy into a larger stratagem to where you can defeat them. And it's the old thing of send in 100 cavalry to draw out the larger army. They'll all be killed, but you're going you're gonna to save 10,000 of your troops in that move by killing 100. But those are men that signed up to go and, 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 and die, and it still really should not be part of the laws of war. Because once you do that, well, it's collateral damage. Yeah, we'll kill a million Iraqis for their oil. Why not kill the little children in that daycare center and make sure that bomb was parked right there and have their camera people ready to get those shots when the heroes go in to save the kids and the, and the murderers sit outside and even set up their own federal Patsy McVeigh. Gentlemen, I'm going to shut up. I want to get into McVeigh, how this ran, the affidavits by Nichols, what we know, the individuals orchestrating this, who they plan to blame it on. And, of course, thank God some of the bombs didn't go off because then their plan didn't go according to, you know, the, uh, the, the, uh, the best laid plans of mice and men often uh, go astray. But, I mean, other points you want to make, or, or speaking to why you've gone public, Chris Emery, I mean, you learned about Oklahoma City. And, 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 and have fought it and risked your life. Hoppy was in the middle of it and, and ran smack dab into the New World Order, but I think that's a good place here. Hoppy, why have you done what you've done versus other people? You know, we would call you exceptional. I know you would just say you're a decent person who does what's right. And, and, and what's led you to do this, Chris? And have you had any threats? Because I know you've talked to police officers and others that have been threatened. Go ahead, Hoppy. Well, I, I, you know, I just don't understand. <clears throat> I guess I'm just <clears throat> built different. But I don't understand people just looking the other way when something bad happens. I just don't understand that. I mean, <clears throat> I wouldn't allow a child to be killed. If I was in the area and I saw a guy attacking a woman or a child, I wouldn't have to know who they were to try to defend them. I mean, that's just something men do. Uh, <clears throat> I don't understand all of my fellow members of the grand jury, I, most of them did not have sufficient background information or intelligence to be on that jury. And that's a different story. But even the ones that did, and there had to be somebody else on there smart enough to know what's going on, but they didn't dare stick their head up from behind the log. And I just don't understand that <clears throat> because... You know, there's a little saying that's just simple as it can be, you know, that I've heard all my life. Uh, all it takes for evil to triumph is for the good people to do nothing. I mean, that's a simple little saying, but it's just as true as it can be. And if, if people will stand up and say, hey, I'm not going to put up with that, then maybe somebody else will stand up. And, you did, and pretty soon, if you could get everybody to stand up, you could make it work. But uh, there, there are just too many people out there that I, I don't know whether it's a lack of education, a lack of genes, genetic structure, a lack of intelligence or what. But I don't understand people that won't stand up for what's not right. Well, it's mind right. control. It, it, it's the television. I've told the story. You see it all the time where a, a man dies of a heart attack or is dying in a, in a Walmart and people walk by him for an hour. Or an Austin cop got run over a few years ago and bled to death for over an hour and no one helped him. I saw a woman choking once in a restaurant. No one would help her and I had to push him out of the way to the Heimlich and they were angry saying, no, wait for police. And I'm like, I didn't say, hey, idiot, she's going to die. 
before the police get here. And I'm not exceptional. I mean, I, I, I took swim team for four or five years, and they had the fire department come by, and, you know, uh, for those that wanted to take it and took a basic life-saving thing. I mean, if I'm choking, I want somebody to help me. I mean, Americans didn't used to be like this. They're in a trance, Hoppy. Uh, comment on that, or, or we'll get a comment from Chris Emery. Um, <clears throat> cognitive dissonance is what I call it. Uh, people are trained <clears throat> by the public school system and other forces to accept certain things as absolute truths. <clears throat> and any time something doesn't fit <clears throat> inside that box, their own personal box of absolute truths, if it doesn't fit inside that, they simply can't accept it. Now, anybody that's gone to a, <clears throat> a concert and heard those instruments tuning up, getting ready for the concert, understands what dissonance is. I mean, it's the most terrible sound you've ever heard. Well, actually, each one of those instruments is playing what it's supposed to play. They're just not playing in the same order. So it's not till a concert starts and they all play in the same order that, that a understandable tune comes out of all those instruments. And the same thing with information. If you're not able to put together information, then you'll never be able to hear the concert. All you're able to hear is the, is the tuning up, the dissonance. And people <clears throat> that can't think outside the box, as they say, people that don't have the independent thought or the capacity to understand or the willingness to accept the truth, and the Bible says that nobody will believe the truth in the end, and I see that everywhere. Uh, people that just, they just can't do that. And it's sad. Well, I was about to add, it's worse than that in many cases. They know the information. They think if they choose to say the government didn't carry out 9-11 or, or, or Oklahoma City or Gulf of Tonkin, even though it's admitted to be staged, that somehow that makes it true. I've had engineers, smart people, uh, sit there and look me right in the eye. You know, they'll confront me first and say, uh, you know, I, I like what you do in some areas, but, but you know, it's impossible that the government can do 9-11. I said, well, what about Tuskegee experiment, all this? What about this evidence of 9-11? He said, oh, I hear what you're saying, but I choose not to believe it. Do you understand what I'm saying? And I said, yeah, I understand. You think you just make a decision and that, that you know, that makes it so. I mean, that is... That is willful mind control, and that is cowards that are so cowardly. At least a, a, a run-of-the-mill coward says, I'm a coward. I'm going to run from this evil and, you know, go hide in your shame. I, I, I get that. I mean, I'm not even mad at those people. Okay, you're scared. You're scared of the scary men coming and getting you. Hey, you're going to die anyways, buddy. Nobody's going to live forever. I'm not going to live on my knees. I, but I'm not mad at a, a straight-up coward. But these, pe these men and women that are so cowardly, they do a mind flip and say, I just choose not to believe it. That is a coward's coward. Chris Emery, your comments on why you've d done what you've done. Right after I'd uh, met with Craig Roberts, he gave me a, a set of blueprints that Southwestern Bell had supplied to a lot of the um, litigants, the people that were suing for insurance claims and, and so forth. And on the uh, second floor, what convinced me to really push ahead on this was there was a, uh, a layout of the deceased, and it list listed four babies in cribs against the front window. They were less than four months old. And as the saying goes here in Oklahoma City, oh, hell no. We're not going to give up until we find out what happened, who butchered these kids, who killed these people when they were going about their business on a normal work day and yanked them out of this life and the life hereafter. And they dare to lie about this. We're better than that. And it's people like Hoppy and yourself, the guys in my film crew. I'm really proud to, to be able to work with you. And this is this is a true American here. Absolutely. And if you look at it, what we do now is going to be a testament to future generations and the fact that we've exposed Oklahoma City, Hoppy from day one, and General Parton and others, and, and, and Jane Graham and the victims, the fact that we've exposed other false flags, they're always trying to resuscitate it. But once the genie's out of the bottle, look at what happened with Kurt Haskell and his wife, both lawyers. They see a sharp-dressed guy getting the underwear bomber, Christmas Day guy, on the plane, arguing, demanding, and so powerful, he was able to order security to let him on without a passport. Then they witness the whole thing happen. They tell the public. The media says they're full of it. And then later, the State Department admits, yeah, the U.S. government ordered us to help get him on the plane.
I mean, the fact is, is we are people who are awake and love the truth. We're everywhere now. And when you murderers try to nuke something or blow something up and dance around as our saviors, everybody knows where to look. We know about your lies about WMDs. We know about you now. Robin Cook uh, in England went public with the lies saying 9-11 was staged. They killed him right after that. Uh, in England, I mean, the point is the, we are exposing one of their favorite tricks and they don't like it. You got any other comments? No, I, you're right on the money, Alex. There's only one other thing I would say, but I don't know what much time we have. Yeah, plenty of time. Okay. <clears throat> the second point that General Parton made that's easily understood and very important. When you when blast pressure pushes, when blast pressure pushes against a steel reinforced column, and it pushes that column over, it does break the concrete, but it only bends the steel bars inside the concrete. If the columns in Oklahoma City had been downed by blast pressure the reinforcing steel rods inside those columns would still be there and just bent over. Parton said those steel rods had been cut. You can see the blast points. Only Imperial yeah. Stormtroopers are so precise. Yeah, so there's, no, there's a big difference, and I do this in a demonstration sometimes. I'll take two pencils. I'll break one with my hands. I'll saw one in half with a, with a little... Uh, hacksaw blade, and I will ask anybody in the audience if they could not put those halves back together again correctly. And everybody, I mean, you can look and see which one that's, that I broke with my hands because it's so irregular and so uh, shattered looking, and then the one that I cut is so smooth, it's anybody can put that back together. And why anybody can't understand that when those columns, when that steel rebar inside the column was actually cut, those had to be cutting charges on the column itself. That was not blast pressure. And well, you can see the video and the photos. There's even blast points right there. Um, expanding on that, why, why do you think from your deep research, Chris and Hoppy, why didn't they just go with the truck bomb? That probably would have killed some of the kids and been, you know, still good for them uh, to be able to get our guns and demonize patriots and blame it on us and make people forget about Waco. Mm. But, 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 but why, why have them go in and wire it all up and all that? I mean, I guess they just wanted to kill more federal, federal employees. Well, because of 93, see, they weren't <clears throat> careful enough. They weren't thorough enough in 93, and they didn't get the terrorist bill passed. So they w planned if every bomb that, was inside the building would have gone off it would probably have leveled the whole building right. and that's what they were looking to do because they were looking for maximum body count to get the legislation passed any other little uh points i mean hopefully tonight we'll bring up uh with you guys some of the other people chris you talked to like police officers and others who were also threatened and what's covered in the film a noble lie but imagine uh the atf and fbi telling you know the, the military bomb expert who's there uh, you forget you saw this. We know where your daughter goes to school. I mean, I would have real trouble just on the spot not going uh, caveman. That was uh, that was absolutely incredible uh, when I heard that. One other point I want to bring up, I was, Hoppy and I were just discussing this um, off uh, during break. Howard Shapiro was the gentleman that was calling for another Oklahoma City bombing, I believe, recently and in the last year or so. He actually served on the city council here in Oklahoma City for a while, was best friends with uh, uh, Hillary Clinton, and also uh, worked with former director Larry Potts with IGI. Well, IGI is pretty much a hit squad. It's it's uh, retired, we know this, and I have no problem saying this on the air, retired FBI agents, folks that pretty much went off uh, off the, the script. And uh, they had an office down town here in Oklahoma City. Howard Shapiro worked for that firm. And so you, you see how these people just have a, it, they're circling back. They have, it, it boils down to, they have no regard for human life. That's who we're dealing with all the time here in Oklahoma City, Alex, trying to research his case. Uh, so I empathize with you when you get excited on your show. We get frustrated up here, too, and it's, it's plain as day. This is a, a poorly written script for a, uh, a uh, uh, 
the Twilight Zone uh, movie, and they just they never say cut. The tape keeps rolling. It always it, that's the way it is. Here. And it's only our denial empowers it. As Hoppy said, evil men and tyrants flourish when good men and women do nothing. That's all they need to flourish, and we empower them by our cowardice, by our weakness, by our laziness. And it's going to get. And, and you're right. People connected to it are, are think we're so dumb. Poppy, that, that, that they sit there and go, man, a new Oklahoma City would sure help us in the biggest newspapers in the world. I mean, how dumb do they think we are? What do you think? Do you want to give the well, I did, I'm just going to put it an aside in there. I'm a member of Mensa, and uh, I got permission to address the local Mensa chapter uh, with my experiences at Oklahoma Grand Jury. And these are people with 150, 160, 70, 180 IQ. These are very bright people. And I, it never occurred to me that they wouldn't be smart enough to figure out what I was telling them. And I was shocked when they didn't believe a word I said. We do have that Oklahoma City interview coming up, but first we want to play a few clips from A Noble Lie, an incredible film that covers so much of that very big lie, that total false, false flag in 1995, uh, which was really just a precursor for the big one, 9-11. Let's play now clips from Hoppy Heidelberg, who we have joining us in just a few moments. Let's play the first one. It was just too important, just too important to the American people to know what happened there for me to keep quiet, because nobody else was going to speak up. The other grand jurors were petrified because they observed on a daily basis the kind of intimidation tactics that were used by the Department of Justice attorneys to tempt to keep me under control. And when they found out about the FBI visits to my home, I really shook them up. Now they seem scared to talk to me in the men's room. And, and mostly, it was a John Doe 2 thing, because as you remember, it's the greatest manhunt there's ever been. And then all of a sudden, hey, he doesn't even exist. If he doesn't exist, what was the deal about the manhunt? I mean, things like that. That was continually coming out. And so we are joined now by the man you just saw in those clips, Hoppy Heidelberg. He was on the grand jury before being dismissed, as well as the filmmaker, James Lane. The film is a noble lie. We have it at Infowars.com. Powerful expose of all the story that was never told in the mainstream media at the time about the Oklahoma City bombing, as well as plenty of unanswered questions. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me now. Thank you for having us. Thank you. So, uh, to some, try to give a basic summary of what is the compelling case here? What are the major things that people perhaps never heard about? Well, <clears throat> the bombing was designed to get the anti terrorist bill passed. The anti terrorist bill had been written and was before Congress in 93, but they couldn't get it passed. Uh, well, it was in 92, actually. And so in 93, they had the World Trade Center, the first World Trade Center bombing. And had it been successful, they would have been able to get the anti terrorist bill passed, but it was not successful. And so they had to come to Oklahoma City in 95. And. Uh, uh, they killed enough people, they had a big enough body count in 95 uh, that they got the anti-terrorist bill passed. There were three uh, buildings in consideration, and uh, Oklahoma City won one. I use the word strangely, but we won because we had the daycare center, and we were the only federal building with the daycare center in it. And they correctly figured that it was the pictures of those little babies' bodies in the paper every morning on the 6 o'clock news that would get the anti-terrorist bill passed. And of course, they were more than happy to flaunt out the victims of the tragedy, but they were never interested in truth, and they particularly did not want this grand jury to go forward. Uh, among other things, I've got a New York Times article from 97 with the attorney general in Oklahoma and, and other figures saying, this is a waste of money, it's useless, and we don't need this investigation, uh, but it's a good thing it went forward anyway. What can you tell us about the grand jury investigation itself? Well, there's actually two grand jury investigations. I served on the federal grand jury investigation that happened in 95, and then Charles Key had a multi-county grand jury seated uh, a year or two later. So uh, we need to be more specific, and, and uh, right. mine was the federal grand jury that happened in 95 within a month or two after the bombing. 
Speaking of the multi-county grand jury with Charles Key, uh, they actually, once they got that impaneled, they actually turned the grand jury over to their enemy, Bob Macy, and he actually used the grand jury to investigate the Oklahoma Bombing Investigation Committee. So the exact opposite of what it was, uh, all the signatures and, and motive behind in, in paneling the grand jury to begin with. I told Charles Key that was going to happen, and I begged him not to have that multi-county grand jury seated. And his lawyer, I have grave questions about his lawyer. His lawyer assured him that it was going to be their grand jury and they'd be in charge. And I said, Charles, it's not going to happen that way. I said, you'll be lucky if you don't get indicted. And he almost was for, for a perjury, they said. Uh, well, could you go back then to the grand jury investigation you were on and, and what were the major things that happened there, including the intimidation and the rest of it, sir? Yeah, well, the, the first thing, we were given a handbook called the uh, grand jury's handbook, and I studied it, and I highlighted it, and underlined it and everything, so I was prepared. So the first day that we were seated, uh, they told us that uh, we were not going to be allowed to question the witnesses. And man, I thought, what in the world is that? And I opened my book up right quick. And of course, it said that's what we were there to do. And so I pointed that out to them. And I said, I'm going to question the witnesses, whether you like it or not, because the book says that's what I'm supposed to do. And we finally, uh, we took a break for a while and we finally came to a compromise. They said, okay, you were going to let you, and I was the only one that was allowed to question witnesses, we're going to let you ask questions of the witness, but you have to give us the questions in writing in advance. And I thought that thought about that a minute, and I thought, well, I know how to get around that. I'll give them one question, and then after that question's answered, I, depending on the answer, I'll go to my next question. And there's, I'm not going to give them all the questions I'm going to ask, because how can I? I don't know what I'm going to ask until I get the answer to the first question. And so I got around that. Uh, but the, but it turned out it didn't really matter. There wasn't there were no witnesses that they called that knew anything about the bombing. Not a, not a thing. It was the same thing that the FBI did. You know they've got mountains and mountains of 302s where they said, look at all the investigation that we've done. But they never asked the important people the important questions. It was just to 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 build a a, a mountain of paperwork to say that oh they had done their job. But all the people, and, and I, I can't tell you the, who testified and what they actually testified to, because that's not right. But <clears throat> the people they called to testify was somebody that had seen Tim McVeigh at a gun show years earlier. I and mean, that's not relevant at all. In fact, not a one of the witnesses that they called to the grand jury was actually relevant to the bombing. It's a, it just amazing. It was just a dog and pony show. Shows how the judicial branch has been compromised. I mean, they were complicit in, in you know, pushing forward the official cover-up story. Well, what are the major smoking guns that, that independent investigators have discovered over the years? Who do we know that was involved other than the two accused? And, <clears throat> and uh, other breaking evidence you can give us. Well, of course, it was an inside job to get the uh, legislation passed. Uh, some of the things that we have learned since is uh, I've learned to calculate the uh, decline in blast pressure with distance so that I can prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that there was no ammonium nitrate bomb exploded there. And even if there were, there's not possible that it could have done any damage because the government reported that the size of the bomb would have generated 500,000 pounds per square inch of pressure, which sounds like a lot, and is a lot. <clears throat> and of course, I was never allowed to have structural engineers come in and tell me how strong the columns inside the building were designed to be. I found out much later that they were designed to withstand 3,500 pounds per square inch of pressure. Well, it sounds like on the face that 500,000 wouldn't have any trouble taking out 3,500. But the problem comes in is when you go to calculating the decline in pressure with distance. In the formula, you have blast pressure over the distance cubed. Well, we use 10. It may have been 12. I, I didn't actually measure the width of the sidewalk down there. 
because but when I got to it, I mean, they, they tore all that out. There's no sidewalk anymore. But it, I, I'm familiar with the building, and it was at least 10 feet, could have been 12 feet to the nearest column. So we'll use 10 because that's easy to calculate. And you put BP for blast pressure over 10 times 10 times 10. That's 10. That's distance cubed. And you multiply that out, 10 times 10 times time, and you end up with 1,000. 10 times 10 is 100, and 100 times 10 is 1,000. Is so you got 500,000 over 1,000. So then you divide the 500,000 by the 1,000, and you're left with 500 pounds per square inch of pressure. Not even close enough, not any chance strong enough to knock out any column in that building. Didn't they say by the time it actually got to uh, the deepest bite in the building, it was about the equivalent of uh, 10 hair dryers? <laughs> well, there's no way that, that pressure can travel in a straight line down the front of the building in the eastward direction and then stop and turn into the building and make that large indentation and take out all of those massive columns way back deep in the building, much further away from columns that were right in front of the bomb, and I've got photos of those columns, and the sheetrock is not even damaged on the bomb. You can see the gray, you can, from the false ceiling to the top of the column, it's gray. That's the concrete. From, from the false ceiling down, it's white, and that was the drywall. That was the sheetrock that was painted white. And you can see that the, the bomb didn't even tear up the drywall, the sheetrock. I mean, if it can't damage sheetrock, it's not going to damage concrete. And in the documentary, we show the actual photographs of this. Columns that were, were closer to the bomb uh, ha still has the sheetrock on them. We've got the photographs. Columns yeah. farther away were supposedly destroyed by this, you know, this uh, truck bomb with ammonium nitrate and fuel oil. Uh, we've got uh, street interviews where people, you know, that day were talking about the additional ordnance that were removed from the building, disarmed. we got people from the military talking about a second large device being disarmed you know the day of uh, the later in the day of uh, April 19th general Parton uh, his report shows where the additional ordinance would have to be placed to create the damage pattern that we do that we see at the Murr building <clears throat> the the biggest bite in the building is offset from the crater uh, and again the crater was much smaller than what the the official report says but it, it would have had to have gone forward and taken a right hand turn it's like the the magic bomb it's like the magic bullet you know and of course, right. the film is A Noble Lie, which I think is a great title. It brings up 9-11 uh, as well, where obviously physics is not what they're interested. They're interested in the emotional perception of this great tragedy. And, and so, of course, the media cover-up is a large part of this whole lie. Uh, could you get into some of that and what you saw with the local media as well as the national media? Well, of course, the, uh, it started out... Uh, with the media telling the truth, but that didn't last 24 hours. Then they changed everything. The only media that continued to tell the truth was Channel 4, a TV station, K4 TV station. It told the truth so strongly that it was purchased by the New York Times and every employee with that station that was working on the Murr building bombing was fired and not only fired but blackballed and have never been able to work in tv again another thing that we saw was um, uh, frank keating's brother martin keating wrote a book uh, the final jihad and it, it the copyright date on this was actually uh, originally 1994 the subsequent publications that came out, uh, they changed the date to 1996. Well, why is that? Well, when you look at the characters in the in the book, it's about someone setting off a, a bomb in Oklahoma City by a federal building being picked up by a state trooper. The character's name was Tom McVeigh. And with an original publication date of 1994, now this really calls into question, uh, you know, what kind of foreknowledge that uh, the governor's office had. I had an appointment with Martin Keating, and I drove all the way to Tulsa to interview him. And I spent the night there and got up the next morning. I had like a 10 o'clock appointment. And so when I called him to confirm my appointment and get directions, he told me that Frank had called him. Now, Frank Keating is, was the governor of Oklahoma at the time. Anyway, he said Frank had called him and told him that he couldn't talk to me. So I didn't get to talk to uh, Martin. 
Uh, later on, he said, oh, I didn't write that book till after the bombing. Well, I want to read you what the, his own publisher says right here on the, uh, this right here on the front cover. I'll read it to you. The terrorist bombings in Oklahoma City and at the World Trade Center were only his first predictions. In other words, he predicted the 93 World Trade Center bombing. Now in this declassified thriller, Keating tells what's next, and U.S. intelligence agents aren't calling it fiction. Inside the cover, it said the final jihad is a prophetic blueprint, a warning of horrifying upcoming acts of terrorism targeted at the United States. It's a wake-up call no one should ignore. This book was written by the brother of the Oklahoma governor at the time who had just been elected governor, a few months before, he had been sent from Washington with sufficient funds to win the gubernatorial contest so that he could control the investigation of the bombing. Because uh, even though it happened in Oklahoma, the Oklahoma State, the OSBI as we call them, Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation never investigated it. The Oklahoma City Police Department, who has jurisdiction, never investigated it. Oklahoma Oklahoma County Sheriff's Department, which had jurisdiction, never investigated it. It was never investigated by anybody except the FBI. And I believe those are the same people that said uh, Kennedy was killed by Lee Harvey Oswald. Talk more, if you could, about the intimidation threats against you, but then separately, the more broad intimidation threats against patriot groups, against third-party candidate supporters in this country, and the attempt to, <clears throat> uh, to foretell another Oklahoma City-style bombing where they're just going to clamp down domestically more and more on this country, as we've seen in so many cases uh, in the news. I'll start with my personal uh, experience and then turn it over to James to tell you about the intimidation of other citizens here in Oklahoma. But uh, <clears throat> the intimidation started the first day of our grand jury meeting. It continued on a daily basis uh, when it was not deemed to be effective enough. Uh, the FBI was sent to my home. And on one occasion, I, my office is, uh, sits in a bay window right in the front of my home so I can see people pull up. And the uh, I, and I, I got to where I could see. I knew an FBI car when I saw one because they looked, had motor pool written all over them, you know. And uh, <clears throat> so this black car pulls up and stops. The passenger, who's on my side of the car, gets out, removes a pistol from his shoulder holster, unbuttons his jacket, or it was already unbuttoned. Anyway, he sticks it inside his waistband and then buttons his jacket back, and they come in. <clears throat> and he was the bad guy. They do a good guy, bad guy routine, just like on TV. And uh, when the good guy wasn't getting the results that he wanted, uh, the bad guy stood up and unbuttoned his jacket and kind of pooched his belly out to show me that pistol. Um, I assume he was uh, trying to give me a message uh, that if I didn't play ball, they were going to shoot me. Well, I knew better than that. The FBI doesn't have the authority to do that. Uh, that's they, they have the authority to do a lot of things, but they're mostly cover-up people. Uh, so I didn't. I just pretended like I didn't even see the gun. I thought it was childish and foolish. And uh, anyway, they left a little disappointed. <clears throat> Later on, they sent another team out, and this time one of the team members was a lady. And I thought, well, this is going to be interesting. I don't know what she's going to do. Is she going to try to kiss me or something? I mean, you know, how, how, how come they sent a woman? Well, it turned out she was the bad guy. Oh, man, it was funny. And uh, when they first came in and I seated them, and she said, do, do you know how much trouble you're in? And I said, no, ma'am, but I'll bet you're here to tell me. <laughs> and everybody laughed, and that just kind of ruined the whole thing. I mean, once you make them laugh, it's not, you can't ever get serious again. So that, that interview was a complete bust. <clears throat> and I finally told him, I said, look, 
why don't y'all go back and tell them you scared the hell out of me? And if anybody ever calls, I'll confirm it. <laughs> and we'll just forget the whole thing because it's, you know, you guys are wasting your time, obviously. And uh, I don't mind. I, I'm, I'm, you're entertaining me, so I don't mind you staying here. But, uh, you know, we're not going to accomplish much here. So they left. And uh, <clears throat> so... Uh, I think the first group was, came down there to make sure I understood that I was going to prison and that every time I spoke out, every time I spoke the truth, was going to be one sentence, and next time I spoke the truth, another sentence, and those sentences, prison sentences, were going to be uh, done one behind the other, what do you call it, consecutively instead of... Uh, in other words, I was going to be in jail for the rest of my life if I kept talking. And uh, that's that's what I was told. And the second one, it didn't turn out very well because once you make them laugh, it's just very difficult to get serious again. Well, and we saw with uh, former uh, or retired Oklahoma City police officer Don Browning. He was part of the canine unit, and he was uh, doing search and rescue there at the uh, Murrah building. He he was asking questions about what was going on and, you know, why they were being pulled back you know, for, for people to go out, for the FBI to go out and pick up uh, papers, you know. Uh, they, they said that there were there was documentation there so, uh, sec, you know, so important to national security that they were going to call off the rescue. Um, he's asking questions about it. One of the FBI agents tells him, you know, people like you that ask questions often end up dead. And he said the way that he was, uh, he, it was posed to him, he felt it was a threat. You know, we see the intimidation going on. You know, obviously, you know, the Oklahoma City was a precursor to 9-11. We've seen information that's come out through the MIAC reports and, you know, most recently the uh, information that Operation Defuse uncovered about the uh, internal documents calling uh, the, the Oklahoma Bombing Investigation Committee's website uh, domestic terrorism. Anybody that has the audacity to expose their corruption and their cover-up has to be silenced. And we see that in Hoppy's case, too. You know, as it, he, he had the intelligence to to go in and, and ask questions, demand answers, and they weren't going to allow that because it's obvious that the judicial branch was just pushing the official story and they didn't want any interference. And we do appreciate your courage, sir. Uh, could you get into, the because the film covers so much, uh, some of the other people who had untimely or suspicious deaths and some of the victims' family members you spoke to, you know, uh, really put a profile on who the real victims of this lie were? I'll let James do that. <clears throat> well, uh, we talked with uh, the uh, mother of Officer Terrence Yakey. Uh, Terry Yakey was a real hero that day. You know, he saved eight people's lives, and he was brutally murdered, and his death was called a suicide. So the facts that surround that uh, are that, uh, you know, he had cut marks all on his arm. They said he bled out so much in the car that you could have dipped it out with a ladle. Uh, and it supposedly walked a mile, mile and a half away into a field and, and with marks on his wrist and his neck uh, and then used a weapon uh, and shot himself at a downward angle far enough away that it didn't leave powder burns on his head. It was declared a suicide. You know, his family asked questions. They said it wasn't suicidal. He had everything to live for. You know, he had just, you know, he was getting promotions. He got the key to the city. He had reconciled with his wife. He, you know, everything was going good. He had never had any, any thoughts of suicide. Um, and when his family asked questions, they said they, that they were crazy, that they watched too much television. Well, Terry had been saying the whole time Time that the official story wasn't the way it actually happened, you know, and I think that he was trying to protect his family uh, from from any danger uh, surrounding the information that he had, so he didn't share that with them. And he was going to a storage facility to uh, actually uh, work with some of the stuff that he was holding back and uh, never made it. Uh, and so it, I think it was a message. It was a message of intimidation to anybody at the time, uh, because after that, I mean, anybody else uh, that knew anything about it was silenced, you know, or else, you know, you'll end up like Officer Yankee. Um, there was uh, there was a, a lot of intimidation along the way. I know that uh, there were people that were involved with the investigation that had been threatened, um, and they just don't want the, 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 the official story to, to be questioned until it's solidified in the public mind. Well, Terrence Yankee's partner, Dr. Chumley, was also so killed. You might go into that. Uh, actually, uh, <clears throat> Chumley and uh, Yankee, I don't know the details of how, where they knew each other in advance of her, they did. But anyway, uh, they brought some of the victims, uh, I don't remember whether ATF or DEA, they brought them down there to Dr. Chumley to bandage up, but they weren't injured. 
And Chumba said, hey, I don't have time for this. Said, These boys aren't hurt. And they said, ah, we need you to bandage them anyway. And he said, y'all get out of here. I'm not going to have anything to do with you. And supposedly, from what I've heard, uh, Yakey was there and witnessed that. And from that point on, Yakey and the doctor, uh, they rented him a lockbox, uh, I think, in a bank at, at uh, uh the town all from Oklahoma City, I forget which one. And uh, they went to putting together documents and photos and things like that because they both realized that this was a complete bogus operation, that it would, wouldn't anything like what the government said. And so uh, they apparently obtained all that documentation uh, from Yankee before they killed him. And then it was some months later, I think, when uh, Dr. Chumley's plane went down. Yes, sir. Uh, in closing, just as James and the other filmmakers are bringing this case back out into the light, you disclosed early on the radio, you, you've got a medical issue and you're probably not going to be in the spotlight yourself. Uh, but what would you like to tell the world uh, about the importance of this case and looking forward, what it means for, for our country uh, as other events are possible, as they continue to try to clamp down on this country and, and put forward a, an evil agenda? If the American people are not willing to believe what I say and not willing to believe what they know beyond a doubt happened at 9-11 and know beyond a doubt that JFK wasn't killed by Lee Harvey Oswald, I mean, everybody understands that. If those people are not going to do anything, if they're going to sit idly by and pretend they don't know the truth and pretend they don't want to do anything, we're going to lose this country. That's a fact. I, my only hope is that God won't allow us to lose this country because he has a, an investment in it. But I, I don't know that for sure. And uh, so I think he's our only chance because it looks like American people are not going to wake up and take any action. And Aaron, this is why it's important for the viewers to go out to the Infowar store, get a copy of the movie, share this with your friends and family, and expose the methodology of state terror. It take away their power to perpetuate false flag attacks to for their own political ends.